Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. This is when life gives you Parkinson's. On Tuesday, March 16th, 14,000 red letters from all around the world were sent to the White House. The letters urged President Biden to make Medicare exceptions during COVID for telemedicine permanent, to ban Paraquat, trichloroethylene, and other chemicals known to increase risks of Parkinson's disease, and to increase the U.S. government investment in Parkinson's research by 10 times. It was the first day of an ongoing campaign to show we give a dime about Parkinson's. In this episode, I speak to all four authors of the book Ending Parkinson's Disease. We get a clear understanding of what the dime is all about, and you'll learn how to get involved yourself. For now, know this. We're looking to increase those 14,000 red letters to 100,000 red letters by the end of April, which is Parkinson's Awareness Month. And you can participate from any country in the world. Go to endingpd.org. In the future, we plan to have red letter campaigns for other countries, too. Now, on with the show. My name is George, and I give a dime about Parkinson's. I really do. When I was a child, I had polio. I was around the age four or five, and I can just remember waking up one day, and my neck hurt, and I couldn't move it. And my parents luckily immediately took me to the hospital where I was diagnosed with polio. It was a very scary time for me and my parents. Even I, I talked to my older sister recently, and she said she was very scared because I was in an iron lung, I guess, to help me breathe. So I, I managed to beat polio, and the March Times was very helpful to my parents. They paid for everything. They covered all the costs, and it was really, really nice. And then three years ago, I had a shoulder surgery, and you know I was doing physical therapy, and my arm wasn't functioning right. I went through the testing, and he came and diagnosed me with Parkinson's. Because I figured I'd fight polio. You know, I could fight this. Two years ago at the gym, the 110 Fitness Gym, I did a Spartan with it with him, and I go to the gym four or five days a week, and it's really made improvement. And then I saw this this give a dime function right here, this thing. And this this was great. This is this sort of brought back a lot of good memories and moved me emotionally too. Uh, when I was a kid, that we had cards like when we put dimes in, and we would turn them. I think we turned them into the school, I think, and we would have cups and stuff, and we went around collecting dimes, which I was very good at. <laughs> What we got to do is, I think, is if we get the kids involved, because have the kids write why I give a dime about Parkinson's, because polio was basically a childhood disease, and Parkinson's is older people. And if the young people understand that they could be like us, their parents could turn out like us, they have to, you know, get motivated to help us and help them. Together, we can end Parkinson's. Hi, hello, welcome to what is now a global event with participants all over the world. We've got all 50 states, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Canada, Japan, Belgium, Peru, Nigeria. Uh, Hello to Iraq and India and Japan and London, Scotland, the Netherlands, Romania. Hello, Romania. This is great. Uh, We are a global community. This is a global force. Uh, And this is We Give a Dime About Parkinson's live event. Uh, As we flood the White House with 10,000 red letters today, we're looking to send 100,000 of these by the end of April. As of midnight, more than 7,000 cards had been sent. So if you signed up yesterday, your cards are in the mail. Um, And today's event is featuring four of the premier world-leading experts in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Ray Dorsey, Dr. Michael Oaken, Dr. Todd Scher, and Dr. Boz Bloom. And we want to welcome them. Uh, but before we bring them onto the stage, these four collaborated in writing this book, this book called Ending Parkinson's Disease. And it's a prescription for action. And if you're unfamiliar with this book, we have a little video we want you to watch, and then we'll get into our conversation. Hi, my name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester. My name is Michael Logan, and I'm a neurologist at the University of Florida. I'm Todd Scherer, CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. My name is Baslu. I'm a professor of neurology and the director 
of the Center of Excellence for Parkinson's at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. My colleagues and I wrote this book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, as a prescription to end the world's fastest growing brain disease. From 1990 to 2015, the number of people with Parkinson's disease worldwide doubled to over 6 million. And if we do nothing, the number will double again in the coming 25 years. Our book proposes a bold pact to end Parkinson's through prevention, advocacy, care, and treatment. If you're here today, then you've taken the first step towards saving the world from this terrible disease. We are joined here today as authors of the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, to proudly announce the paperback version of our book. And I highly recommend that you read it, order it through Amazon or your favorite bookstore. And just to make sure, all proceeds of the book are donated to efforts to help end Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, to a large extent, is preventable. Certain chemicals such as paraquat, chlorpyrifos, and trichloroethylene all increase the risk of the disease. But unlike many other countries, the United States has not banned them. We must work together as a community to advocate for changes in government policy. We must remove environmental risk factors from the environment. And we must ask for more federal funding for research into how to stop this disease. My passion to work in this field is that we can do a lot of things to support and help families with Parkinson's. And that is truly a multidisciplinary team effort. It's much more than just a medication that your doctor is prescribing. It is physiotherapy, occupational therapy, it's a healthy diet, it's exercise, it's a good mental health. And above all, it's a well-informed, educated patient and family. And again, our book helps you to get that useful and valuable information. Science can provide the answers we need to end Parkinson's. And there are exciting new treatments on the horizon. However, we need to move therapies and innovations faster. With COVID-19, we moved at warp speed to develop vaccines faster than we ever did before. This would not have been possible without the huge amount of government funding. Millions of people and their loved ones are affected by Parkinson's disease. However, millions of us can work together and fight back against Parkinson's. With our efforts, Parkinson's doesn't stand a chance. I give a dime about ending Parkinson's. I give a dime about ending Parkinson's disease. I give a dime about ending Parkinson's disease because we need to increase our research funding by tenfold to change the trajectory and to help and impact as many lives as possible. We're gathered here today because we're all hoping for a brighter future for people with Parkinson's. Ultimately, of course, we want to cure this disease or hopefully slow down progression or maybe arrest progression altogether. We need more funding for that. So we're launching this campaign. I give a dime about Parkinson's. Now I'm from Holland. We don't do dimes in the Netherlands, we do euros. But I give a dime about Parkinson's as well. And I urge you to join our campaign, send a red letter to the White House, step up the funding, raise awareness, so that hopefully the dream described in this book, ending Parkinson's disease, will one day come true. Well, this book, this book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, is really an important book. It pulls no punches. It's a prescription for action, and it urges all of us to take urgent action towards ending Parkinson's disease. Today, I will interview each of the doctors, uh, get an update on the prescription for action outlined in the book. Uh, they'll talk about some breakthroughs in Parkinson's and uh, research and care, and we'll talk about what's in the pipeline and how you can make your voice heard. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. I was diagnosed in 2017. Uh, a year later, I launched the podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's. And last year, after reading this book, it changed my life. Uh, I invited some people to chat about the book on Zoom, about 10 people. And that one action, just inviting 10 people to talk about the book on Zoom, led to a movement called PD Avengers. We are now approaching 3,000 members. We have uh, people who are PD Avengers from 59 different countries around the world. 
And we now have a, a more than 50 partners, uh, PD organizations uh, like the Fox Foundation and the Brian Grant Foundation and uh, the, the APDA, the EPDA, you, Parkinson's UK, all around the world. Over 50 organizations and, and, and events and groups around the world have now said yes. We want to partner with the PD Avengers, and we look forward to, for you to join us, too, at pdavengers.com. Now, on page 192 of the book, it says Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing neurological condition in the world, and we can end it. And then the ending Parkinson's disease pact is introduced. Pact, P-A-C-T, prevent, advocate, care, treat. And we're going to ask each doctor to speak to one of these areas today. The PACT begins with P. It stands for prevent. And Dr. Ray Dorsey is going to join us. But uh, Dr. Dorsey, Surgeon Dennis Parsons Burkett, who we can thank for discovering dietary fiber, said this as it relates to the importance of prevention. If people are constantly falling off a cliff, you could place ambulances under the cliff. or you could build a fence at the top of the cliff. We are placing all too many ambulances under the cliff. It reminds me of Parkinson's disease, frankly. Uh, so Dr. Dorsey, how could Parkinson's possibly be preventable? Well, Larry, first of all, thank you very much for hosting. Thank you very much for creating the PD Avengers. If you're not a PD Avenger, please become a PD Avenger and join this global grassroots organization at pdavengers.com. A second, I want to thank uh, Alistair Glidden and Gerardo uh, Torres and our entire team at the University of Rochester. I don't think some of them have slept in the last uh, month for uh, getting this event organized. And I thank my friends and colleagues and co-authors uh, for joining us today. So we need to stop people from falling off the cliff. And the way to do that is to prevent the disease from ever happening. We have known for uh, at least a century that Parkinson's disease is largely a genetic, I mean, a largely an environmentally defined condition. We've known for 20 years that there are numerous environmental risk factors uh, associated with the disease. Three of them that we call out in our uh, campaign are a pesticide called Paraquat, another pesticide called Chlorpyrifos, and another chemical called trichloroethylene. These chemicals all increase the risk of Parkinson's disease by up to not 5%, not 50%, but up to 500%. We need to ban them so we can prevent people from ever falling off the cliff. Now, in the year since the book was released, What's been the breakthrough moment uh, that it, as it relates to prevention? I think it's right now. Uh, we've uh, sent 7,000 of these cards uh, are going out to the White House today for many of you uh, listening. If you haven't received a card, we want 10,000 of these cards to go out today. Uh, email us at info at endingpd.org. Ask for 100 of these for your friends and family members. We need 30 people to ask for 100 of these and commit to getting them to their friends and family. We'll get to 10,000 uh, today. And by the end of the by the end of Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month next month, uh, April, we can get to a hundred thousand and really start to make our voices heard. Now, what is your biggest challenge right now? Well, the first action in, in, in the card is to ban Paraquat, uh, and this pesticide is considered the most toxic herbicide ever created. It dates from the 1950s. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't, and it increases the risk of Parkinson's disease by 150 percent. Um, 32 countries have banned the pesticide, including China. However, use of the chemical has tripled in the last 25 years, doubled in the last decade, and increased 20% in the most year for which data are available. We need a ban Paraquat. Uh, three months ago, in, in October of last year, the EPA reauthorized its use. It's time to turn, it's time to stop this and start preventing people from ever developing uh, Parkinson's by the nature of they work, by the work, water they drink and by the foods that they consume. Yeah, if, if you are a PD Avenger, we're creating an international working group on Paraquat and other toxic chemicals as it relates to those things that are impacting Parkinson's. Go to pdavengers.com after this event and click the link, get involved. And if you're not a PD Avenger, sign up is free on the website. So you can just go there, sign up to be a PD Avenger and then sign up for the working group. Uh, you'll see the link. Um, if... Uh, it, if you had to say like the biggest learned uh, learning that you had this year after writing the book, what, what, what have you learned? I, I think we're learning that the Parkinson's community is thirsting to be, act, to be active and to start to prevent and end Parkinson's disease. 
We've frankly been overwhelmed uh, by the generosity of you and the PD Avengers. We've been overwhelmed by the feedback uh, from, you know, 7,000 people uh, signing up to receive this. We've gotten, you know, pictures from people from all over the country. We get emails that Alistair replies to every day. We love it. We want more of it. The sooner we get to 100,000, the sooner we make 1.1, 1.2 million Americans' voices heard and 6 million voices around the country, around the world heard, the sooner we can prevent and end the world's fastest growing brain disease. Well, Dr. Ray Dorsey, thank you for everything that you're doing in helping to end Parkinson's. Uh, we're going to move on to the second letter of the pact. It's A, and A stands for advocate. Uh, every important change in our society for the good at least has taken place because of popular pressure, pressure from below, from the great mass of people. Uh, that was Edward Abbey. Uh, he's an American author and essay, essayist, uh, remarkably known for his advocacy of environmental issues and public land policies. But joining us to speak about Advocate is Dr. Todd Shearer from the Fox Foundation. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Shearer, advocacy takes many different forms. How are you defining advocacy? Thanks, Larry. Um, so I think of advocacy... Um, for people with Parkinson's really in two ways. One is individual advocacy. And part of what we've been talking about is educating yourself, arming yourself with information and really advocating for your care to make sure you're getting the best care that's available currently. And I know uh, Boss and Michael are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also, as you mentioned, I think that there's a grassroots advocacy that's needed to really push for much more substantial change. Um, and uh, the Fox Foundation coordinates um, the United States policy advocacy effort at the federal level. Um, and we are um, just to people looking to take action. We are planning our, our uh, policy forum coming up where we can really speak to legislators and the executive branch to talk to the specific issues around environmental policy research funding that we want change at the federal level. As it relates to advocate uh, part of the pack, what, what has been the breakthrough moment of the year for you? One of the most important things that we've seen um, in the last couple of years is really um, making some headway around getting a better handle on the incidence of Parkinson's and who actually has Parkinson's disease. So there's an, an effort that's now been pushed through that is led at the CDC, which is really working to do an accounting of all the people in the country that have Parkinson's. This is critical, as Ray was mentioning, to understand what could be the causes, how many, where are people impacted by the disease. We're seeing similar effort, efforts at the state level. There's now a California state registry. And this is really a critical starting point to know, you know who's getting Parkinson's and how they might be uh, getting the disease. What is the biggest challenge as it uh, relates to uh, the, or the pain points that you're facing as it relates to advocacy? The most important thing that we're really pushing for now is more research funding for Parkinson's disease. Um, that's on the on the card that we're sending. Um, there's so much exciting research that's been done on, on the brain. There's a big brain initiative that was done over the last 10 years. And we really need to get more research funding towards Parkinson's disease, which will build on these, these building blocks of research to lead to new treatments and a cure for the disease. Yeah, I was just uh, talking to your uh, colleague, Ted Thompson, and he was noting that currently what the uh, economic burden for Parkinson's in uh, the United States is $52 billion, and we only spend $240 million a year on research. Yeah, and we think that's unacceptable. That, and most of that money, actually, that is spent on the care for Parkinson's comes from the U.S. federal government. So we think it's an incredible return on your investment to put the money into research and get better treatments and prevent the disease. What is the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council? So the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council is a group of over 20 Parkinson's organizations in the United States that have all joined forces to advocate uh, for public policy change together with a common voice. Um, it's, and Ted Thompson, you just mentioned, leads that group. And we think it's, as, as Ray was mentioning, really important for us to all group our voices together and make a lot of noise and, and push those changes through that we want. And if people want to participate in the uh, policy uh, forum, uh, they can go to michaeljfox.org slash join, uh, join dash us dash Parkinson's dash policy dot forum, or just go to michaeljfox.org and search policy forum. I think it'll, it'll come up. Hey, Todd, thanks so much for all you and the foundation are doing for Parkinson's. Let's turn our attention to the third letter of the pact, C, which stands for care. 
Uh, we have another quote. This is from Margaret Mead, an anthropologist. She said this of care. Now, never believe that a few caring people can't change the world, for indeed, that's all who ever has. And now let's bring in Dr. Boz Bloom, who uh, will see to it that we care about what's going on today. Uh, Boz, how well are we caring for people with Parkinson's around the world? Well, you know, there's two ways to answer this. On the one hand, I tell all my patients every day when I do my clinics that having Parkinson's today is a different thing compared to, say, 10 and definitely 20 years ago. We've got better treatments, pharmacotherapy. We understand deep brain stimulation better. There's multidisciplinary care. At the same time, we're not doing, you know, my patients tell me it's still levodopa, which is the cornerstone of treatment. I still, you know, I, I remember uh, Michael J. Fox saying, despite all the advances, I can still not button my tie, you know. So today it still is a, a disease that you'd rather not have for many people. So we're not doing well enough. Since publishing the book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, have you seen any aha moments in uh, relationship to care? I think one of the major breakthroughs that we've seen in the past one or two years is that Parkinson's disease doesn't exist. Um, there will be a paper coming out uh, in a month or so in The Lancet where we argue that there are 7 million Parkinson's diseases in the world, as many as there are people living with this disease. And I think that is a major breakthrough. And it's not because everybody's genes are different. It's because everybody's needs and wishes and priorities are different. That understanding, I think, is major progress. Um, we've also come to understand increasingly that the word patient is wrong. You know, there are no patients with Parkinson's. There are persons living with this disease. And we need to support persons and families and get rid of the word patient. I think another major breakthrough is multidisciplinary care. I'm a neurologist, but we increasingly realize that, again, this will be a figure coming out in, in the Lancet paper. There are no stars in the team. The star is definitely not the neurologist. And credit to Michael Oaken, who's on the call. But there's only one son in the team, and that's the, that's the person living with this disease. And I think those are major breakthroughs to my mind. Uh, what is the biggest challenge? I think one of the biggest challenges is, is how we can really engage people living with the disease as partners in care. And this means giving adequate information. Michael J. Fox Foundation is wonderful at this. Parkinson's Foundation is good at this. How can we promote self-management? How can we promote a healthier lifestyle? We're now increasingly realizing that exercise and diet are crucial. Um, shared decision-making, making people with the disease partners in the healthcare process. And I think a second major, major challenge is providing timely access to care. I think one of the silver linings of the crisis is that we've introduced telemedicine. This is a call to President Biden to make sure that we reimburse telemedicine you know, for donkey's years to come. Um, but the reality is that most people in the world have no access to a neurologist, let alone to a well-organized multidisciplinary team. And my passion would be to make sure that within a decade, at the most, every person with Parkinson's across the globe has easy access to multidisciplinary care. For you personally, uh, after publishing this book, how have you changed the way that you care for your patient, people with Parkinson's? You know, I, I'm, what I'm going to say may sound dramatic but it comes from straight from my heart. I've dedicated my life to Parkinson's. My, my, my passion is to make myself unemployed because if I'm unemployed, it means Parkinson's is gone. And being able to publish this book, being able to work with my wonderful colleagues, Mike, Ray, and Todd, but in particular, having listened to the wishes and needs of patients, the reactions that we've received, I'm, 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 get, I'm, get, I'm having the goosebumps <laughs> as I'm saying this, has motivated me to the bone to wake up every morning, to go to bed every night. And I won't stop until Parkinson stops, period. Amazing. Thank you so much, Boz. Uh, we are going to now turn to the fourth and final letter uh, of the PAC, which is T for treatment. Um, and uh, before we get to Dr. Michael Oaken, uh, another quote. Um, 
The celebrated Harvard Medical School teacher and physician Francis Peabody said this about treating patients. The secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Michael, what was the best treatment for Parkinson's when you started medical school? Well, I love that quote, Larry, and um, I love you, Larry. You're doing. Oh, I love you too. For, for Parkinson, and we need we need to to have just a million more Larry Giffords out there. You know, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't want to depress you with the answer, but it's been over two decades since I graduated from medical school. And what we learned, we had prescription pads. It wasn't computerized. It wasn't PowerPoint. It wasn't email. We had a prescription pad and we wrote the name Cinemet, or if you're in Europe, you wrote the name Matapar um, on a pad. And that was the best treatment that we had. And we're still stuck there 50 years later. Mm. Since you wrote the book, what's been the biggest breakthrough? You know, uh, oh my gosh, you know, there, there, there's so many that course through my mind and, you know, we've had this huge push now toward nutrition and the microbiome and dietary therapies. And can we understand how inflammation and when things get angry in the body, how that can affect things, neuroimmunological approaches like vaccines, you know, we're really hopeful, Larry, to see all those breakthroughs materialize soon. Um, but there have been some really great recent uh, additions, new delivery methods of old medicines make a difference for people today. There's some new cool things that we can do with reading your brain signals and, and, uh, and pushing electricity in one way or the other. Uh, we can even now, uh, you know, more carefully make little lesions in the brain sometimes. And we're so hopeful that as we move forward, we're going to use what we know about folks who have Parkinson and identify those who have mutations in their genome, things like with big words like LARC2 and GBA, and then precision medicines on the horizon, just like you see on TV for cancer. So what would you say is your biggest hurdle in the treatment area? Well, you know, it turns out that if I say $200 million to you, you might, you know, might say, oh, that's a lot of money. That's awesome, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's not awesome. So $200 million a year for a disease is not awesome. And I really want to make sure people understand that and that if we want to change the trajectory of a disease, we spent a long time researching the book with Ray and Todd and Boss. And we came to understand how important the PACT, the Prevent, Advocate, Care, and Treat is. But for the diseases that moved, polio, HIV, HIV, Larry, 3 billion with a B, okay, 3 billion with a B. So what's the biggest challenge? Well, even if we doubled from 200 million to 400 million, you think we get twice as many researchers, twice as many research, you should get goosebumps like Boss Bloom for that. So we have to ask ourselves, are we funding this enough, given what Ray Dorsey's taught us about the growth of this? And we have to ask ourselves, what happens if we speed up? And we called for an operation warp speed, you know, kind of like what we saw with COVID in a recent Daily Beast uh, editorial. But we must, we must commit ourselves to increase that investment by tenfold, because I think the alternative is not a world we want to live in. So what treatment therapy is in the pipeline now that gives you goosebumps? You know, um, kind of like boss, I get goosebumps not only for care, but for all of these new treatments. Uh, it may surprise people to know that laboratories have been developing vaccines for Parkinson. You hear about vaccines on the news. Don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to learn a lot from it for sure. Like COVID, there's also monoclonal antibodies that are moving their way through, through the system. There's international scientists engaged in using new drug targets, new devices, gene therapies, light and genes together called optogenetics, and designer receptors um, that are activated by designer drugs, so-called mm -hmm. dreads like we use in, uh, in cancer. So, you know, they, there is this horizon, Larry, that's super exciting for the next generation. We need to work not just on treating and helping people who have symptoms now. We need to focus on symptoms that aren't responding to current therapies like walking, talking, 
thinking, for example, are immediate needs now that we must act on now. But we've also got to move towards slowing the disease down and then to precision medicine. You know, to could we start to knock them down like one at a time? And as Boss says, Parkinson's disease is not Parkinson disease. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now we've heard from all four of the doctors. We're going to bring them all on screen, open the floor for questions. Uh, I'm going to just get to the first question because I know somebody's going to ask it. Uh, wh what's the timeline for the cure? I mean, it's, it seems like it's been five years away for the last 30 years. Well, I think I, I wouldn't dare to make any predictions about the cure because I don't want to create false hope. I have said on numerous occasions, you know, I, it's no secret. I'm, I'm, I'm 54. Um, I know I look much younger, but uh, <laughs> uh, during during but the serious note is during my career, I will witness the arrival of the first real disease modifying treatment that will slow down the progression of Parkinson's. And once we have that angle, and if we get the dose right, the duration of the study right, we time it right and deliver it early on in the disease in a personalized manner, as Michael was saying, maybe we can arrest the progression. And then if we deliver it in an early phase, we can hopefully prevent new people from developing the disease. I think those terms are realistic during my career. Whether I will witness a cure, that I don't know. I can tell people that the insights in what is happening in the brain are greater than ever. So this is a time of hope. It really is a time of hope. Can I Anybody elaborate, else? Larry? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in 1938, uh, ordinary Americans started mailing dimes uh, into the White House uh, to raise money for polio. And in 1954, 16 years later, Jonas Salk uh, created a vaccine that prevented polio and essentially eradicated it from almost every part of the world. And in 1981, we confronted an unknown, uniformly rapidly fatal uh, virus. And into that vacuum, uh, a group of HIV activists adopted the motto of silence equals death. And in 1996, we had protease inhibitors that changed the course of HIV, um, made it uh, such that HIV is associated with a near normal life expectancy, and it's among the most treated conditions uh, in the world. Those two examples uh, all began by grassroots activism, which we're hopefully starting today, and all saw tangible, demonstrable change in the span of 15 or 16 years. If we end our science around Parkinson's disease, and hopefully we end that today, I think in the next 15 or 16 years in Boss's lifetime, when he's still playing volleyball, we're going to have um, ways to prevent Parkinson's disease. We'll be preventing it and we'll have demonstrable uh, beneficial treatments uh, for it. Amazing. Anybody else want to chime in there or are we good to move on to the next question? All right. Next question. Um, I, uh, what's the best thing I can do to keep myself as healthy as possible while waiting for better treatments? So I'll start with that and, and just say, well, first of all, you, you made the first and most important um, move, the critical move in recognizing that you can do something. And, you know, recently we wrote a review for the Journal of the American Medical Association on Parkinson. Boston and I and Christine Klein have one coming out for, for, uh, for Lancet just this, uh, this coming year in 2021. And, and the, the change, the sea change, Larry, has been that we now know that there are things that you can do, okay? Exercising every day is huge. We're learning, you know, more and more about it. We don't know exactly the right dose. We don't know exactly the right types of exercise, but we know exercise is a first-line therapy. We know first-line therapies to multidisciplinary um, specialties like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and swallow early, social work early, getting the care partners early, 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 early is different. We're shifting now and understanding that you got to have a plan. And probably the most important thing, if I could impart, you know, just a pearl from doing this for a while is that everyone with Parkinson needs to have a plan and needs to understand it's a dynamic disease. You're going to have challenges every day. You got to get a team around you to take care of those challenges and you got to have exercise. You got to have a multidisciplinary theme and it's not just the drugs. Okay. I'm a drug dealer, right? Cause I can write prescriptions, but I'm telling you, Larry, it's not just the drugs. And um, boss, what, what do you think? You're an expert on this. I completely agree about the exercise. I think people should really know that exercise is not something we believe in. 
exercise is now an evidence-based intervention. There is class one evidence, the highest degree of evidence, that regular exercise, and by exercise, I mean aerobic exercise, do something that makes you pant every day for about 30 minutes. It will reduce your motor symptoms, the stiffness, the tremor, the rigidity. It will also help with your non-motor symptoms, sleep, the slow bowel movements, uh, the, the bone strength, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have very good reason to believe that it may, it may help to slow down progression of the disease. So exercise is your number one thing. Hope and optimism, I think, is the other one. People who are optimistic do better. And it's easy to say, I'm at this end of the fence. You know, you're at the other side of the fence. And I realize how difficult it is. But if I may briefly say, Larry, we did a survey on internet about asking about silver linings of Parkinson's. People ask me about, is there a positive side, an upside to Parkinson's? And my initial reaction was, of course there isn't. You want to get rid of this disease. But we were overwhelmed with answers of people who said, yes, there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is, I made new friends. I became an ambassador. I, I turned to a healthier lifestyle. I cut down on work and spent more time with my wife and my family. I'm not saying you should be thankful for having Parkinson's. We want to get rid of this ugly beast. But think of the silver linings as an, as an upside. Uh, I got a question here from Paul Mayhew Archer, which is uh, uh, kind of in line with the whole hope concept. Uh, Muhammad Ali, Michael J. Fox, and Billy Conley, three of the most loved and influential people in the world, were not able to persuade the world to end Parkinson's. What chance do we have? I guess I'll, I'll jump in a little in that um, I take a, a more optimistic approach. We're not starting from zero when Ray lays out these timelines, because we also talked about a lot of the progress and attention that has been brought to the disease over the last two decades. Um, there's a, still a challenge of um, the secret of Parkinson's, but this, you know, people being afraid to tell others they have the disease, but we've come a very long way in that over the last two decades, I think driven a lot by Michael and uh, Muhammad Ali. Now there's a person you could relate to and people understand what you're, you're going through. So, so I actually think we have a running start to what we're trying to accomplish now. Um, even, the, even when we look at the research funding, it's gone from 100 million to 200 million in the last period of time. We want more and we want it, we're urgent and we're, we're not satisfied. Um, but I, I don't think we should think that not, nothing's happened to date. There's a lot of building blocks to build on, which I think gives us even a greater chance of success. Just to amplify that, I don't the think other, any person- Just to finish. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go. Just to finish, this is a, as as Boss and Michael mentioned, this is a very difficult disease to to understand and and to develop treatments for. So I think it's going to take a lot of determination, and there's unfortunately going to be windy roads along the way, and we can't be discouraged. And just to back up Todd's point, I don't think there's been any single individual who's made a bigger change in the course of Parkinson's disease this century than Michael J. Fox. I don't think any single individual has made a bigger course change in the course of Parkinson's disease than Michael J. Fox's century. They have funded $1 billion in research of this uh, century, almost as much as the NIH. No, no foundation comes close to the NIH, but Michael J. Fox Foundation has. Our understanding of the genetics of Parkinson's disease has been greatly advanced. The challenge is that we need more than just Michael J. Fox, more than just Muhammad Ali, more than just Team Tebow. We need 1.2 million Americans to make their voices heard because these individuals can't do it by themselves. They can't do it by themselves with just Brian Grant and Davis Finney. And we need six and a half million people around the world to make their voices heard. And we need their spouses and their family members to make their voices heard so we can prevent and end this disease. Another question for you, Dr. Dorsey. Uh, when is it going to become the normal to combine other specialties into the care of a person with Parkinson's and, like they do in Rochester and other centers around the world? No one knows this better than Boss. What, what is it specific, Larry? Well, combining the specialties into the into the care for the person, so it's not just right. Yeah, you know, right. ad hoc. Right. No. So clearly, you know, Parkinson's is such a complex disease that no single specialty is by itself enough to help people. So the old idea that a neurologist is God on the throne helping these people uh, is old fashioned. On our latest count, Michael and I had counted over 30 professional disciplines who potentially can help you folks. 
Now, that's not to say that all 30 disciplines should be involved for every person, let alone at all times. It just illustrates that there are many people out there that are able and willing to help you. What we do feel is valuable is that these people have expertise or passion for Parkinson's, that they have seen more other people with the same condition. So you're not the first patient with Parkinson's who are treated uh, uh, by this person. But think of the physiotherapist, occupational therapist, the dietitian, the speech therapist. But think of a dentist. Think of a psychologist. Think of a gastroenterologist. The gut is crucially important for people with Parkinson's. You need regular bowel movements. So the range of disciplines is, I would almost say, infinite. And that should give you hope. Uh, But try to find somebody who has at least a passion to help you as a person and who maybe has some experience in Parkinson's. Medicare reimbursement for telemedicine has been a silver lining for speech, physical, and occupational therapy for PD during the pandemic. How do we keep it going? Uh, So Medicare's coverage of telemedicine, the setting of the COVID pandemic, is one of the silver linings, but that coverage is temporary. Pre-COVID, Medicare spent less than 0.1%, less than one out of every $1,000 on telemedicine. You couldn't get telemedicine in your home. You couldn't get telemedicine if you lived in an urban area. And you couldn't get telemedicine from occupational speech, physical uh, therapists and the like. One of the big policy challenges following COVID is to make sure that the coverage of telemedicine, which has benefited half of Medicare beneficiaries in the country, is permanent. Permanent just not for neurologists, but for a wide range of clinicians, including the 30 that Boss and Michael have articulated, and that we ensure that telemedicine can be delivered into people's homes. And that's why it's the second recommendation uh, on the cards to make Medicare's coverage of telemedicine permanent. We, we, just to ahead. add in, this is a great um, reason to join the, the unified policy efforts because we need to make sure the legislators and the administrators and the government know that people want this coverage. And you don't, you don't get things if you don't ask for it. Yeah, we mentioned earlier that uh, there's maybe 7 million different Parkinson's diseases. Does that mean that we have to find 7 million cures? Not necessarily, Larry. Um, you know, it, it it turns out that when we begin to understand, you know, a disease, and so let's take Parkinson. A lot of the symptoms are common, but not everyone looks the same, right? One in five people may not have a tremor, right? And so there are differences, but there are also things that unite it, it sort of clump it together. And so as we understand how the disease works, we look at the genetics, we look at these, these cycles, the life cycles of cells, and we start to look at the biology, we realize that there is some unity of concept. And so there is um, some um, you know, potential that as we move research forward, that a lot of research is going to apply to many people, but you've got to focus your efforts on things that are tangible. You've got to climb those stairs up. You know, you've got to, you've got to make those advances and then you'll make the leaps, you know, that come with it. And so I don't want people to be discouraged thinking that there's no path forward if you have all of these different forms of Parkinson's. I think it's actually the opposite, but some of the dominoes have to fall, okay, for the, all the dominoes to start to, to fall. And, um, and, and that's how, that, that's how I kind of look at this picture. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you to just give a closing statement because uh, I know uh, a couple of you have to take off for our radio show and then we're going to uh, stick around and answer some questions and fill out our cards and, and chat with some folks. But uh, let's start with you, Todd. Um, what's, what's, what, what do you want people to know? Um, I think one of the other things I just wanted to add that we haven't talked about, which is um, the important role that people with Parkinson's play in the research enterprise, that we can't really get the insights into the disease. We want to enroll the clinical trials as quickly as possible. So that's another area of action that um, people can take because, you know, we, we can, uh, Michael and Boss and Ray and I can sit in our conference rooms all day and talk about what we think is happening. The only thing tell us what's happening in the disease are those with the disease themselves. So I think, so, I think people yeah. should really think about it as well. Yeah, you, you, you've started recruiting for the, uh, the landmark study, PPMI 2.0. Uh, can you talk about that? 
Yeah, so the uh, the PPMI study is really focused on um, understanding the, the heterogeneity or the variability in Parkinson's and and the normal progression of the disease. So we actually could then determine whether new treatments are slowing and altering that progression. And um, what's interesting now in the, the new phase of the study is actually looking for people prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's. So there are certain risk factors that we've talked about and really trying to go as early as possible in the disease process to understand what's happening and how we can alter that. And you're recruiting parents, brothers, sisters, and children of people with Parkinson's. Uh, the study is looking for people with Parkinson's diagnosed within two years. You can learn more at michaeljfox.org slash PPMI. Todd, thank you for all that you and the Fox Foundation do. We really appreciate it. Uh, Ray Dorsey, uh, what is your final statement? We need more Michael J. Foxes in the world. Uh, and we launched this campaign. So we've got 7,000 people making their voices heard. We want 10,000 today. Email us at info at ending PD. We need 30 people to commit to mailing 100 of these letters out so we get to 10,000. And but in Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month next month in April, let's get 100,000 messages sent to not only the White House, but to leaders around the world so that we can change the uh, change the course of Parkinson's disease and bring about the end of this debilitating disorder. If you order a hundred cards and distribute them, you will become a give a dime ambassador and they will put your name and picture on the website. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> All right, Michael Oaken, you're up. Right. So uh, what I want people to take home is that Parkinson is the world's fastest growing neurologic disorder, period. It's growing at an unprecedented pace. One in 15 people will receive the diagnosis of Parkinson over a lifetime. And in the past decade, the number of Americans with Parkinson's increased 35% at a 20% faster clip of growth than Alzheimer's. The expansion, if it continues, Larry, unchecked, it'll be medically and economically devastating. And we, we, us, have chosen a shuffling pace. We need to speed up. We need that warp speed. We need to punch it, punch it up, put the pedal to the metal, go at warp speed, increase the funding by 10 times, You know, have all the organizations, Fox, Parkinson's Foundation, Parkinson's UK, Davis Finney, you know, the Brian Grant Foundation, APDA, they're all invited. We need to all get together and push hard. Push hard, yes. Uh, all right, Boz, you get the final word. Well, that's a tough call. I would say a number of things. One is keep the hope. It is a time of hope. You know, people are working hard. And if we punch hard, if we get the funding right, we will fight this disease and we will win this battle together. So keep up your hopes. Second, make sure that you are well informed about this disease. You can't be a partner in fighting, fighting this disease if you're not a well-informed. So support the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I just want to echo their amazing work that they've been doing. They are one of your number one resources of information. So make sure that you are well-informed so you can become a real partner in this fight. Three, regular exercise. Do it every day, 30 minutes, aerobic exercise. Do something that makes you pant. It will help you. Four, if you go to your doctor, there are maybe 20 things you want to see improved. You know what happens if you tell your doctor, I want 20 things improved? He sighs in despair. Nothing happens. Go to your doctor well prepared and give him your top three, better even top two, better even your top one priority and ask him to solve it, address it carefully. And next time, you come back with your number two priority. That'll really help your care. Don't flood your doctor with 20 problems and nothing will happen. And keep up the hope. That's my keep main hope message. alive. That's right. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys and the book. Uh, the, the, the paperback version of Indy Parkinson's disease comes out today. And the best reason to buy that book is because there is a feature of the PD Avengers in the back. There's updated information. Uh, and, uh, you know, you guys are amazing. You're, you're like the original PD Avengers. So thank you for all you do. And, uh, and we're going to stick around and talk to the folks, fill out our cards. And uh, we're going to help you and uh, help us end Parkinson's 
to get disease together. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, we, we do want to send off 10,000 red letter messages to the White House today. We're looking to send 100,000 by the end of April. April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Uh, so letters, postcards, emails all around the world are welcome. Uh, you can still help. Like this is not going to end today. This is the beginning of a campaign, uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll create international messages. I think in June we're going to sort of push the message in Canada, and, and there's others around the world that we we need to help push. So this red letter campaign, while this is about the United States, will continue and become an international movement because it, we we have to we have to build that urgency. Um, do not tape a dime, like an actual dime. Don't tape that to your postcard because the mail system won't deliver it. <laughs> so it will not deliver your mail if there's currency taped to it. Also, uh, make sure that you attach a letter forever 55 cent stamp, not a postcard stamp because the, the postcards are too big for a postcard stamp. So here are your action items for today. Mail your card. Or if you haven't filled out your card, you should uh, order one at endingpd.org right now. Um, and we want to send 100,000 again by the end of April. So get everybody to do it in your family, uh, your friends, your community. Uh, become a Give a Dime ambassador. Request 100 cards to distribute to friends, family, and your community by emailing info at endingpd.org. Uh, we all already have Give a Dime ambassadors. Uh, and so that's pretty exciting. The, the congratulations to Jennifer Parkinson and Brett Miller and Marge Fleming, Anna Dunbar, Becky and Bob Allen in Florida. Thank you so much. Anthony Moose, Lauren and Mission Viejo. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's amazing. A hundred. Um, sign up to be a PD Avenger. Go to pdavengers.com. Uh, and the updated paperback version of Ending PD is available today. Uh, buy the book, read the book. Review the book at your favorite bookstore, wherever you like to buy books. All the author's proceeds are going to efforts to end Parkinson's disease. This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's, a Curious Cast podcast. Our story producer is Dila Velazquez, sound designed by Greg Schott. The presenting partner is Parkinson Canada. Diagnosed with Parkinson's? You're not alone. Parkinson.ca. Thanks also to our promotional partners, PD Avengers, a global alliance of people with Parkinson's, our partners and friends, standing together to demand change in how the disease is seen and treated. You can join now at pdavengers.com. The Michael J. Fox Foundation Parkinson's podcast hosted by Larry Gifford, available on Apple Podcasts and at michaeljfox.org. Spotlight YOPD, the only organization in the world with the singular focus of raising awareness of young onset Parkinson's disease. You can find them at spotlightyopd.org. In the World Parkinson Congress 2022 in Barcelona, Spain, go to wpc2022.org for details on special virtual events you can participate in now. And thank you for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're there, give the show a five-star rating and feel free to comment. You can also engage with us on social media. It's at Parkinson's Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can email us at parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. Keep positive. Keep exercising. Keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Send in those red letters. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.